Hello everyone, it's Halfway Mike, I hope you're all doing well. Today we are back with Lord of the Rings Total War Remastered, which is a mod for Total War Room Remastered. I'm doing a faction guide and overview for the Noldor Elves, or the High Elves. They are one of the strongest factions in the mod, thanks to the strength of their general units and also the last alliance trips that you can get access to later in the campaign. As you can see, we do have a split starting position. We have three settlements in the west and also Rivendell in the north. In order to achieve victory with the Nordor Elves, you do need to defeat the Orc Rabbles, Isengard and Mordor. So it is a fairly long campaign, but it is a very enjoyable one as well. I'll start with unique characters and General's bodyguard units. As the Noldor Elves or High Elves, you start with five Generals. We've got the faction leader, Elrond, the faction heir, Eladan, and then three other generals being Zerdan, Elrahir, and Glorfindel. Most of your generals start in and around Rivendell. If we go to Rivendell, you'll find Elrond. Now, he is actually restricted from moving away from Rivendell. So if we select him, you'll see there's no option to move him out. So you can't really use him in your campaigns, but if the settlement gets attacked, he will be there to defend it. It also makes it quite difficult to see his model, but I have run a campaign where I've let Rivendell rebel, just to be able to show that for the purposes of this video. In terms of his General's Bodyguard unit, he has the King's Guard unit, which is the generic General's Bodyguard for the Noldor Elves, or the High Elves. The stats on this unit in particular are slightly inflated due to the experience. However, essentially it is a very tanky sword unit. It doesn't have any missiles, but it more than makes up for that with the defense and attack stats. When you consider it's really high defense and the cost three hit points, it just makes them very tough to kill. And the fact that they have a reasonable attack stat as well means that if you have an army with five or six general units, being the King's Guard units, then that army can basically just steamroll through enemy territory. So that covers Elrond and the King's Guard. Next I'll move on to Eladan and Elrhea. The first thing to note is the models. This is the generic general's model for a, for a Noldor general or a High Elf general. This is what they will always look like. They look very similar to the high Noldor units, except they have the red accent around the middle of their outfit. In terms of the General's Bodyguard units for Elri here and Eladan, they have slightly different units. So they have they both have the Imodrim Sentinels. These are recruitable units in the campaign. They are region specific, so you can only get them from tier three of the forge in Rivendell. But they are essentially just hybrid melee and arch units and very strong in both departments. Again, the stats on this unit are a bit inflated by the experience, but the missile attack of 19 on the base unit and the missile range of 170 is about as good as it gets for arch units. And then the defense and attack also means that they are more than capable in melee combat. And then you have to consider the plus two hit points as well, which makes them a bit tougher to kill. So these are very useful general units, given that they are they double as archer and melee units. So make sure to make use of these. Both Elra here and Eladan have the Imladrim Sentinels as their general's bodyguard unit. But once they die, they won't come back. So try not to lose them needlessly. So that covers Elrond, Eladan, and Elrhir. I'll next move on to Glorfindel. So Glorfindel does have a custom unique model. You'll see that it looks very similar to the Imladrim Sentinels unit. If we pull up the info panel there, you'll see that the way they look is very similar to Glorfindel's model there. In terms of his general's bodyguard, he has a 
Noldor cavalry units accompanying him. So this is your only general that has a cavalry bodyguard. The unit itself is not brilliant. The melee attack of 9 is quite good for a cavalry unit, but the defense and charge are quite low. And it doesn't have any plus hit points to make them more tanky. So it's not a brilliant unit, but it's the only cavalry general you've got, so it will still be useful. Uh, just try not to lose them needlessly. So you have four of your generals around Rivendell, and that leaves one general remaining who starts all the way uh, across in the Grey Havens, and that is Serdan. He again has a custom model. So you'll see his model looks slightly different. His model looks very similar to the Mithlond Sentinels. So like with the Imladrim Sentinels, the Mithlond Sentinels are another region-specific unit that you can only get from the Grey Havens, but that's besides the point because Zerdan's Gemma's Bodyguard is actually the King's Guard unit, like with Elrond. So we've already discussed this unit. I'm not going to go over it in detail, but again, it's just a very strong sword unit. So that covers all the Gemma units for the High Elves or the Nordal Elves. You have five overall and two actually three of them have specific or unique models being Zerdan, Elrond and Glorfindel and between those five you have two units of the King's Guard which are very powerful you've got two units of the Imladrim Sentinels which are the unit that doubles as an arch unit and then you've got one unit of cavalry but the fact you have so many generals in this area means it's very easy to start taking settlements along the mountains here. Just because you can stack up those generals and take them fairly quickly. Next I'm going to move on to the economy. So the economy for the High Elves actually isn't brilliant. And that's because of the restrictions on some of the building trees that you have access to. I find it easier to grow my economy through investing in armies to conquer more settlements rather than investing in your existing settlements. So if you go to any settlement and open the income tab, you'll see that income is derived from three streams. You've got farming income, taxes and trade. Now, every settlement will have a base farm income and you can increase this by building farms and increasing that farmland. Unfortunately, the elves don't have access to the farm building tree, so you're never really going to be able to get, get much farm income from any settlement. And that actually is quite a restriction on the elves, because if you take a faction like Gondor, for example, that can build all the way up to tier five of the farm, they can get around 1k per settlement per turn from farming income alone. So that is definitely a cap on your income. Because you don't have access to farms, it means that you don't you can't develop your population growth either. So that can become an issue because taxes is also dependent on the level of population. However, some of your settlements have access to the hidden resource healing, which allows you the water building tree. And these buildings do give you population growth. It tends to only be a few settlements that have that hidden resource and it's generally the starting settlements for only a few factions but take advantage of this building tree where you can I don't know I think that Grey Havens, Forlond and Harland all have that hidden resource and because it is quite hard to get your population growth going because you don't have farming just bear in mind that if your settlement has hidden resource elves and that is generally any of the starting settlements of the elven factions your government building will give you population growth, at least the first two tiers will. So the Chamber of the Elders will give you 2% population growth and the Hall of the Elders will give you 1% population growth, but then after that you don't get any population growth. So just bear in mind it's not always worth it to upgrade if you want to get the benefit of the extra population growth for a bit longer. So that covers 
the farming income and farms and also taxes and next I'll move on to trade so generally there are three buildings that can increase your trade income actually there's four so there is the trader which is here you've got the ports which increase your trade income and then you've also got the roads. So the second tier of the roads will increase your trade income. And then there's one which isn't shown here because we can't build mines. But if you take a settlement where it's possible to build mines, then there is a mine building tree and the elves get access to two tiers of that. So taking the first economy building or the trader, you can build this this building line in any settlement that has hidden resource men elves dwarves or glass so generally that is any of the elves starting settlements any of gondor rohan harad and the easterlings starting settlements will have hidden resource men and then any of the dwarves starting settlements will have hidden resource dwarf so you can build a trader in any of those regions so that's not a restricted building by any means you'll be able to build that in most settlements uh, in terms of ports that is obviously limited to the settlements that are on the coast but even then there's some settlements on the coast where you can't build the port but just bear in mind that the ports are a very good income source so i would definitely get the first tier of port over anything else if you're trying to Get your economy going and then lastly we've got the roads so the elves are not restricted in terms of the roads they have access to two tiers which is as much as any faction gets and that will give you a small boost to your trade income the elves are also not restricted in terms of the ports they can get tier three of the port which is as good as any other faction and they can get the top tier of the trader as well so now that we've covered farms trade ports and roads just want to cover mines so mines are incredibly lucrative in this game um, so you want to try and prioritize the settlements that allow you to build mines because that will really get your economy going so in terms of your starting regions you've obviously got three regions in the west and then one in rivendell now in the west there are quite a few regions around the mountains here that have access to be able to build mines so i would definitely prioritize going for those and then if you move over to rivendell there's a lot of settlements along the mountain ridge here where you'll also be able to build mines so that's just something to note that i would prioritize going for those settlements because the mines is probably the most lucrative building in terms of getting your economy going So that's about it for how the economy works. I would generally prioritize getting the first tier of the port over anything else. And then just check if you're going to build the trader, just check how much income it's bringing in because a lot of the time it doesn't bring in that much. So if we take the Grey Havens, for example, and build the trader, that's giving you 60 gold, which isn't a terrible return on investment. But if you go to somewhere like Arlond or Forlond. Yeah, that's only giving you plus 13. So just check that tab before you invest in a trader because it's not always worth it to go for one. And a lot of the time it's better to invest in an army that can take a settlement in the mountains so that you can get you mines. And I mean, just generally taking settlements in, just conquering settlements will increase your income because every settlement has a base income so yeah i think that's it for the economy now we've discussed the economy i'm going to move on to recruitment there are four buildings to be aware of when it comes to recruiting as the nold or elves you've got your standard barracks and forge building lines the barracks giving you access to your weaker early to mid game troops and the forge giving you access to your stronger mid to late game trips. The port will also give you access to one unit, the Teleri Marinas. 
And lastly, the Nordal Elves have access to the Golden Forge, which gives you the ability to recruit the high Nordal units from the last alliance. However, that building is locked behind a script, and I've put a separate section in the video for that. So, I think it makes sense to discuss the barracks first, or the training ground when you're playing, as it's called when you're playing as the Elves. So, as I was saying before, this gives you access to your weaker early game troops. The Tier 1 allows you to recruit the Elven Archers, and Tier 3 allows you to recruit the Elven Scout Cavalry. Now, there are quite a lot of restrictions and conditions attached to this building line, as there are for a lot of the Elven building lines, so just bear with me here. So, you can build Tier 1 of the training ground in any settlement, but to build beyond tier 1, you need that settlement to have hidden resource elves. So in terms of which settlement have hidden resource elves, almost all of the starting regions for the elven factions, like the Nordal elves and the Lothlorien elves, and the Markwood elves, will have hidden resource elves. And then a lot of the neighbouring rebel settlements will also have hidden resource elves. So it's not massively restrictive. But there's not going to be that many regions where you can recruit units that require hidden resource elves. So to demonstrate that, I have taken a settlement in Andrast for the purposes of this video. This settlement does not have hidden resource elves. And you can see I can only build tier 1 of the barracks. So that's the restrictions on the actual building line itself. There are also restrictions on the units that you can recruit from this building line. So tier 1 gives you access to these elven archers. However, to be able to recruit the elven archers, you need that assessment to not have hidden resource orc. So as we were saying before in Andrast, I can recruit the elven archers from this barracks because this assessment does not have hidden resource orc. However, if we go to a settlement in Mordor that I've taken control of for the purposes of this video, this settlement does have Hidden Resource Orc, and you'll see that even though we can build Tier 1 of the barracks, it doesn't give access to any troops. So that covers the restrictions on the building line itself, as well as the units. The Tier 3 does give access to the Scout Cavalry, but obviously to get to get to tier 3 of this building, you need that region to have hidden resource elves anyway. So that is a requirement of that unit. So that covers the barracks. Next I'll move on to the forge, which gives you access to your mainline units. Tier 1 of the forge gives you access to the spear guards. Tier 2 gives you access to the Noldor sword guards. And tier 3 gives you access to the Noldor cavalry. So like with the barracks or the training ground, there is also restrictions on the forge. You can build tier 1 of the forge in any settlement, but to be able to build beyond tier 1, you need that settlement to have hidden resource elves, like with the barracks. So for example, this settlement here in Gondor does not have hidden resource elves, and I can't build beyond tier 1 of the forge. That's the restrictions on the building line. Like with the barracks, there are also restrictions on the units that you can recruit from that building line. So, in order to be able to recruit the spear guards from tier 1, you need that settlement to not have hidden resource orc. So if we go back to our settlement in Mordor, you'll see that even though I can build tier 1, of the forge, I can't recruit any units from it because this settlement has hidden resource orc. And that is not the same for Andrast, where I can recruit the spear guards from the forge because this settlement does not have hidden resource orc. So that's the restrictions on the units. And then obviously, to be able to build past tier 1, you need hidden resource elves in that settlement anyway, so hidden resource elves is a requirement of all the units after this as well. So that covers the 
training ground and the forge. There is also some extra things to cover with the forge. There are some region specific units that the Nord or Elves have access to. So tier three of the forge in Grey Havens will give you access to the Mithwand Sentinels, which are a region specific unit and one of the best units you have access to. They are a hybrid melee and arch unit and very strong in both areas. Missile attack of 18 and 170 is just about the best in the game. And then the defense and attack also means they're capable of melee combat, especially has, as they have the plus two hit points, which makes them a bit more tanky. But you can only get those from the Grey Haven settlement and tier three of the forge. The second region specific unit is from Rivendell, the Imladrim Sentinels, only recruitable from tier three of the forge. So these are very similar in stats to the Mithwand Sentinels in that they are hybrid melee and arch units and very strong in both departments. So when playing as an order elves, I usually rush the tier three forge in Rivendell and the Grey Havens just to get access to those units because they are the strongest units you have access to until you get the Golden Forge, which is much, much later into the game or the campaign. Okay, so that covers the barracks and the forge. I did mention before that the port gives you access to one unit, but this unit does take three turns to recruit and it's not particularly strong. You definitely have better options. It's got quite a low unit size. So generally I don't recruit these unless I have to. It does have the plus two hit points, which makes them a bit more tanky. Like with most factions, you do have the upgrade buildings. So the practice fields, range and master blacksmith, as well as the training grounds. And using these, you can upgrade your heavy attack, missile attack, armor and light attack. Just something to note when playing as elves, getting more missile attack is always useful. But I wouldn't build these in settlements where you are dependent on that settlement for money because they all bring with them tax penalties. So usually I just choose one or two settlements to build all these upgrade buildings in and then just send my forces there to be retrained rather than having them in your recruiting center, which generally would have a decent amount of income. Okay, so that covers how recruitment works when playing as the Nord or Elves. The next section will be on the secret fourth building, the Golden Forge, which gives you access to those last alliance troops. In this section, I'm going to explain how to get the Golden Forge, which is the fourth recruitment building. It gives you access to the high Nord or Elven units from the last alliance. The building itself is locked behind a script called the Nord or Return script. And in this campaign, I've set this up so that we're about to trigger it. So I have spoken to one of the developers and they are looking at lessening some of the requirements to trigger the script. But the current thinking is that the script will stay the way it is for the initial public release. So that's the one I'm going for in this video. So the requirements of the Noldor return script are that you have the tier four forge in Harland, Forland, and the Grey Havens. So you'll see in Forland we have the Tier 4 Forge. We have the same in Harland, and we have one turn remaining on the Tier 4 Forge in the Grey Havens. As well as that, you need to be hostile towards Isengard, the Orc Rabbles, and Mordor. And then you need to be not hostile towards the other Elven factions and Gondor. So you'll see that we're allied with the Galadrim and the Sylvan Elves being the other Elven factions. And we are not allied or enemies with Gondor. So we're not hostile with them. And therefore we are meeting those requirements. So once I pass the turn here, the forge will be built in the Grey Havens and we will trigger the script. The Nolder are returning to Middle-earth. You can recruit them in the ports of Harland, Forland and the Grey Havens. Okay, so the Noldor return script has triggered. And you'll find in Harland, we've got the Golden Forge, and that's the same for Forland and the Grey Havens. 
So we can get four units from the Golden Forge, which are the High Noldor Swordsmen, High Noldor Spearmen, High Noldor Archers, and the Elnerth Cavalry. These are probably the strongest units in the game. They all have incredible stats. They're very tanky because they have plus hit points. The only real negatives are the length of time it takes to recruit and the low unit size. The upkeep per turn actually isn't that bad considering how strong they are. But that is how you get the building and are able to get access to your best troops. As you can see, we are triggering this quite late at turn 67. And in this campaign, I've basically done everything necessary to get them as quick as possible. So in a normal campaign, it might take a bit longer to trigger the Nolder or Term because you'll need to focus on other things. But that'll be it for this section. That is how to obtain the Golden Forge. And it's only these three settlements that that building does spawn in once the script triggers. So now we've discussed how the economy and recruitment works. I just want to touch on campaign strategy. When playing as the Noldor Elves, your victory objectives are to defeat Mordor, Isengard, and the Orc Rebels, as well as holding 15 provinces. However, I'm sure once you've defeated these three factions, you'll have more than enough to meet the 15 province objective. The victory objectives are slightly awkward given your starting position because the Orc Rebels start in the Misty Mountains. And they have a few settlements to the north, east, and south of Rivendell. Isengard is obviously then to the south, and Mordor is on the other side of the map to you. So in terms of actual strategy, what I like to do is use Rivendell as a springboard to capture the Orc Rabble's settlements in the mountains. Just bear in mind that when you're fighting the Orc Rabbles, you don't need to take all their settlements. You just need to wipe out all their generals, and then the faction will naturally be destroyed. So it's just something to, to bear in mind, because in all my campaigns, I've never actually had to take all their settlements. Usually, they run out of generals first. In the west, I like to just start conquering these rebel settlements. The rebel settlements in the mountains are very lucrative, because you can build the mines there. So that's a, a great way to get your economy going. And then some of the settlements to the south here also have hidden resource elf. So you'll be able to build those up and get some of your best troops there. So this is a very good region to try and conquer just to get your infrastructure going. Then once you've done that, you usually send forces down to the south and forces from here to east, and then your forces will generally meet up in the middle around Isengard. Once you've taken Isengard, you can then set your sights on Mordor. So Mordor is a, quite a big challenge when playing as a high elves, because generally by the time you get there, they've had a long time to build up their forces. They'll have multiple full stacks of monsters that will be very difficult to deal with. I should just note as well that we are on patch 0.94. And in this patch, most of the Elven factions are fully complete, and that's why you can see all the Rebel regions here as the map has been fleshed out. And it's the same for the Lothlorien Elves as well. Mordor and Gondor, for example, still have some more settlements to add, but they'll be coming very soon, I'm sure. Go so back on to Mordor. So they are a big challenge once you actually reach them. A way you can deal with them is either just to wait until you get the Noldor Returns trigger, and that will allow you to recruit your best soldiers, and you'll be able to deal with Mordor uh, fairly efficiently. Or you can just recruit full stacks of Mithlond Sentinels, as well as the Imladrim Sentinels from Rivendell, and that will give you an edge against Mordor as well. Just bear in mind your generic German's Bodyguard is extremely strong. The King's Guard is one of the strongest units in the game. There's, I don't think there's really much that can match this in one-to-one -one combat. So if you get a stack of five or six generals that have this King's Guard unit, they will be basically unstoppable. So try to take advantage of them if you can. In this section, I'm going to do a full run-through of the unit roster. As you might expect from an Elven faction, they have a great array of archer units. 
limited cavalry options and respectable melee infantry. They also have the incredibly strong late game last alliance units. We will start with the elven archers. These are your early game missile units. Every elven faction can recruit these from tier 1 of the training grounds. As you would expect from an elven archer, their missile damage is very high at 16 and their range is also excellent at 160. Even though they are an early game elven arch unit, their missile damage and range is actually on par with elite archers from non-elven factions. They take 2 turns to recruit and have an upfront cost of 400 gold plus upkeep of 110 per turn. And I would say that is very cheap given their high missile damage. Having said that, their melee attack and defense are terrible, so I wouldn't use these in melee combat unless you had no other option. And they do have quite a low unit size at 72, which can be a hindrance as some of the factions you fight against in the early game, such as the goblins, have very high unit sizes. So even though the archers are strong, you only have 25 missiles per soldier, so your ammunition will only go so far given the low unit size. But overall, a very solid early game unit. Next, we have the Elven Scout Cavalry, which are Missile Cav, recruitable from Tier 3 of the Training Grounds. I find Missile Cav to be fairly overpowered in general in Rome Remastered, just because you can quite easily take out full armies without taking any losses. So naturally, I would consider this unit to be very strong, especially given the Missile Attack of 18 which is even higher than that of the Elven Archers. The real limit on their power is the ammo of 900 or 15 per soldier, which won't go that far in battle, as well as the low unit size of 60. They also take 3 turns to recruit and cost 690 up front, as well as 180 upkeep per turn. They aren't awful in melee, but I wouldn't go charging head first into units. I would use them to flank and chase down enemy units, but overall, I would say they're a great addition to any roster. Next we have the Noldor Spear Guards, which are a decent early game unit that you can get from tier 1 of the Forge with a 2 turn recruitment length. The attack and defense aren't bad at the start of the campaign, and once you've incurred the initial 410 recruitment cost, the upkeep of 110 per turn is actually quite cheap. The only real issue is the fairly low unit size of 100, which is a fairly common occurrence among the elven units. They won't kill many men, but they can hold the line while you flank with some deadly archer fire, which is where the real killing potential comes in. Overall, I would say they're quite good value for money. Then we have the Noldor Sword Guards. These are the first sword unit that you have access to, and you can get them from tier 2 of the forge. They cost 420 gold to recruit and have a cheap 110 upkeep cost per turn. That is fairly common among the elven units just because there are some restrictions on the economy and the amount of money they can bring in, so they wouldn't be able to afford units with a very high upkeep cost. The main issue I have with the Noldor Swords Guards is the low defense. I've found them to be quite underwhelming in battles, almost to the extent that I don't really use them. The generic general's unit for the High Elves is a very strong sword unit, the King's Guard, which we'll look at later. So in the early game, I either use a stack of generals that are the King's Guard units or spears to hold the line, while I get most of the kills with the Elven Archers. The unit size of 120 is fairly standard, if not a bit low, and the attack is also reasonable. Lastly, they do take two turns to recruit, which is standard for the early game elven units. Up next, we have the Noldor Cavalry. These are the first non-missile cav you have access to. You can get them from tier 3 of the forge, and they cost 740 gold, as well as 200 upkeep per turn. Like with the Scout Cavalry, they also take three turns to recruit. I'd say these cavalry are mediocre. Their attack is solid, morale is very good, and the unit size is on the higher end for cavalry. However, the defense and charge is a bit on the low side, and they'll get outscaled fairly quickly. As the Nordor Elves, you don't have access to much cavalry. Only one of your starting generals has a cavalry bodyguard, 
and all the generals that spawn in after the start of the campaign have the Swordsman Bodyguard. Additionally, until you get the late game Noldor units, the only cav you have access to is this unit and the Scout Cavalry we covered earlier. So if you do want to use Cavalry, this is really the only option that you have. But I generally find the Sentinel units that we're about to cover next are strong enough to get by without Cav when playing as the Noldor Elves. Next, we move on to the two region-specific Sentinel units, being the Mithlond Sentinels and the M. Ladrim Sentinels. These are what I would call the first elite tier units of the High Elves roster. When I'm playing as the High Elves, I rush the tier 3 forge in the Grey Havens to be able to get these as quickly as possible so that I don't need to use the early game units. The Mithlon Sentinels are a hybrid melee and archer unit, but I would say more weighted towards being an archer unit. They have a missile attack of 18 and range of 170, which is about as good as it gets for archer units. Given the melee attack of 6 and the defense of 17, they are also more than capable in melee combat. Additionally, they have the plus 2 hit points, which makes them extra tanky and tough to kill. It is quite unusual to see the plus hit points outside of General's Bodyguard units and Monster units. The downsides are the 3 turns to recruit. Fairly low unit size of 80 and high 960 gold cost. Although for a unit of this strength, I do think it needs to be balanced in this way. Despite the high initial cost, the upkeep per turn isn't that high at 260. And I, was, I would say the one-off cost is worth it, as a unit of these would last quite a long time. One of the other problems in being region specific is that you do need to take them back to the Grey Haven settlement to retrain which can be awkward, so try to get most of your kills from Arch Fire. If you send them into melee combat and lose a lot of them, then it's going to be a pain to send them back to the Grey Havens, although the Grey Havens does have a port, so it can be quite easy to transport those troops via the sea. Next, we have the second region-specific unit, the Imladrim Sentinels, that you can only get from a Tier 3 Forge in Rivendell. Like with the Mithlon Sentinels, I usually rush the Tier 3 Forge in Rivendell to be able to get access to these as soon as possible. They are very similar to the Mithlon Sentinels in terms of stats, unit size, number of times to recruit, and cost. They just have plus one missile and melee attack, but one less defense. They also have a slightly cheaper initial recruitment cost and upkeep per turn. Most of the things I said about the Mithlon Sentinels apply here. I would just say that the positioning of Rivendell makes it slightly more awkward to use them, just because you don't have the benefit of the sea to transport them, and also Rivendell is very close to the mountains and you can't build roads in those settlements. So trying to get them back to Rivendell to retrain can take quite a long time. But again, a very solid unit and definitely the backbone of your mid to late game armies when accompanying them with the Mithlond Sentinels. Next we move on to the High Noldor units, which are the best of the best. They are the troops from the Last Alliance. In terms of raw stats, there is very little that comes close to these units, but that is reflected in their high recruitment cost, the number of times to recruit, which is four in most cases, and also the low unit size. The high Noldor troops are also locked behind a script that needs to be triggered in order to get the building to recruit them, that I did cover in the recruiting section. It does take a while to get these units, which is why I usually rely on the Mithlond and Imladrim Sentinels for most of the campaign. By the time you've got these, you're probably well on your way to winning the campaign anyway, so I won't go too much into detail on them. Let's start with the High Noldor Swordsman. Their attack is 10 in line with other elite melee units. The defense does not look that high, but again, like with all the High Noldor troops, they have the plus 2 hit points, so they're still very tanky. Their morale is also extremely high at 37, so they won't break easily at all. In terms of the negatives, they take 4 turns to recruit, 
have a very low unit size of 89 and have a recruitment cost of 1,180. Having said that though, the per turn upkeep is not that high at 260. Next we have the High Noldor Spearmen. They have a very high defense stat of 27. When you combine this with the plus 2 hit points, this makes them very tough to kill. The attack of 7 is also excellent for a spear unit, but once again, they take 4 turns to recruit, have a low unit size and cost 1030 up front. Having said that, like with lots of the elven units, their upkeep per turn is relatively cheap at 230. Then we have the High Noldor Archers, the only High Noldor unit that takes 3 turns to recruit instead of 4. They cost 910 gold up front and have an upkeep cost of 200 per turn. Their missile attack is 20, which is the highest in the game for a non-bodyguard unit. Their range is also unmatched outside of general units. Their defense is a bit on the low side, but again they have the plus 2 hit points, which adds to their tankiness. The unit size of 61 is also very low, but they are deadly for what you can get out of them. Then we've got the El Nerth Cavalry, which is the High Noldor Cavalry. I think you've probably got the gist of it by now. They're incredibly strong in terms of the raw stats. They have quite a low unit size, a high cost of 1380, and take 4 turns to recruit. Like with most of the Elven units, the upkeep is fairly low at 310, but I think that's to balance the fact that the Elves can't build bombs, which is a natural restriction on their income. Then we have one of the coolest looking units on the roster, the King's Guard. This is the generic General's Bodyguard for any Generals that spawn in after the start of the campaign. While they are Elven units, they don't have any missiles, they are purely melee units. They are incredibly tanky with 30 defense and plus 3 hit points. These can basically beat anything in one-to-one -one combat, which is one of the reasons that the Nordo Elves are so powerful in the late game. If you have an army with 5 or 6 generals in that have the King's Guard, that will basically beat everything else that it faces. Last but not least, we have the Teleri Mariners, which are the only unit that you can get from the port. I've really just included them for completeness because I don't think they are very good. They do have the plus 2 hit points, which makes them quite tanky but they have a low unit size. They are skirmish units, so basically javelin units with quite low range and ammunition, and they're not great in melee combat either, but they are there to recruit if you have no other option. So that's going to be it for this one. I hope you enjoyed the faction guide and overview, and I will see you on the next one.